Hi everyone, welcome back. You look wonderful. Today we're talking about the kind of toxic workplaces that inspired The Devil Wears Prada, both the book and the movie. Let's unravel the myths and realities of abusive supervision and what it really costs to pay your dues. I'm going to start with a summary of the movie and the book, but you can skip forward a few minutes if you're already familiar. In the movie, a young woman named Andy Sachs aspires to be a journalist, but instead lands a job at a prestigious fashion magazine called Runway. Although initially indifferent to fashion, Andy takes a job as a second assistant to Miranda Priestley, the magazine's editor-in-chief, in order to break into the publishing industry. Despite struggling with Miranda's extreme expectations and the cutthroat environment, Andy adapts and even excels, changing her attitude and her wardrobe in the process. Miranda's attitude towards Andy also changes for the better. But as Andy becomes more absorbed in her role, her relationships suffer, leading her to question her priorities. Ultimately, Andy decides to pursue her original career aspirations and parts ways with Runway amicably, having earned the respect of Miranda Priestley. In the book, Andy gets the job as second assistant to Miranda Priestley, and despite learning to adapt and changing her wardrobe, Miranda's attitude towards her does not change. Throughout the novel, Andy struggles with the nearly impossible demands of her boss and the high-stress environment of the fashion industry. As Andy becomes more involved in her role, her personal life starts to unravel, affecting her relationships with her friends and her boyfriend. Her obsession with pushing through to lock down her dream job brings about a moral and identity crisis as she grapples with the, prom the compromises that she has to make in order to succeed. Eventually, Andy reaches a breaking point and quits her job by telling Miranda Priestley to fuck off. She does not leave Runway on good terms, but is still able to find work writing for other publications. In recent years, the character of Miranda Priestley has received a lot of praise and sympathy for a few different reasons. And one of those, I'm sure, is that Meryl Streep in the movie portrayed a much more dimensional character than the one in the novel. The term abusive supervision describes having a boss who's more of a nightmare than a mentor, and the character Miranda Priestley is a prime example. Her behavior has sparked much debate online, specifically about if Miranda were a man, would her actions simply be dismissed as part of a tough love leadership style? But for me, this discussion isn't just about gender. It's about how we excuse toxicity in the workplace under the guise of achieving results. I'm here to argue that abusive supervision does not yield the kind of positive results that a non-abusive boss could inspire. There are studies available to us today about, for example, how abusive basketball coaches have teams with higher amounts of technical fouls. There's also the issue of high turnover in jobs that consistently exploit and abuse employees. But on the topic of gender, when we say shit like, no one would care if Miranda was a man doing the same thing, it only excuses her behavior and her male counterparts. It also gives the impression that to be as successful as a man in a position of power, a woman has to emulate that kind of toxic behavior, which is dumb. Now, let's talk about the cost of ambition. Andy Sachs, like many real young professionals, enters an exploitative work environment with high hopes and really good credentials. But what she encounters is a culture that grinds down personal values and mental health for the sake of profit. This narrative is extremely common in industries like publishing, fashion, finance, and beyond, where hustle culture prevails over human dignity. It's also prevalent in companies that have a kind of mythos surrounding the opportunity and privilege of working there, like Disney, for example. People who work at Disney parks are consistently told that they're lucky to be there, and yet they're paid like shit for the honor of working there. Jojo Siwa's XOMG pop girl group has come out in a Rolling Stone article recently about how they were mistreated by Jojo and her mother. And it's extremely reminiscent of how Jojo was treated on Dance Moms. Can you put her picture back up? She deserves to be on the pyramid. She was in the group dance. She deserves nothing. Don't have an attitude that you are entitled in this world. You are not. 
You deserve nothing else. You earn it. You can't stand here and cry. I have no, 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 no crying children. Not. Well, if you yell at me, I'm gonna cry. Get out. Let's go. go. Let's get out. There's something to be said about how a cycle of abuse continues because someone like Jojo Siwa believes that because I had to go through this, now so do you. When people say things like, Miranda's just a tough boss and people are too sensitive, they're really just telling the world and future employers, hey, you're allowed to treat me like shit as much as you want and I'm just gonna shut up and take it. It's often said in these industries that newcomers need to toughen up, but this mantra is dangerous. It's the same logic that lets abusers like Harvey Weinstein or Dan Schneider claim that they're just teaching newcomers to pay their dues. But it's not about working hard. It's about enduring unnecessary hardship and abuse, which is often glorified. I'm gonna bring up some specific examples of the abusive workplace because I know that I'm going to get some pushback on the word abuse being used here. What's so incredible to me about this scene specifically is how effective it is in manipulating Andy into submission. This is the moment her sense of self is broken. Andy has just returned from a stress-filled weekend where she tried and failed to book Miranda a flight out of Florida during a hurricane. This failure comes after Andy did everything, just short of calling the National Guard for an airlift. This task was totally irrelevant to Andy's skills, but her failure of this task is what gets Miranda to acknowledge for the first time that Andy is a skilled and competent employee. Copyright is kicking me right in the Miranda Priestly right now, so I have to simply relay to you all of what is happening in this clip that I'm referencing without showing it to you, and here it is. Miranda is saying that her girl's recital went great and everyone loved it but her because she was stuck in Miami and it's somehow Andy's fault for not bending the laws of aviation and also time and space to make the impossible possible. Never mind that Miranda chose work over her daughters in the first place, Andy was supposed to make everything better. Miranda says she took a chance on the smart, fat girl because of her impressive resume and her big speech about her work ethic. Please note that Miranda throws in more than a little sarcasm here. And that all her other assistants, the skinny, stylish ones who worship Runway Magazine, were stupid. But Andy was supposed to be different. She was supposed to fly the damn plane herself. I'm taking a lot of liberties here, but you get the gist. I added captions that say what she actually said. Notice how Miranda never once complimented Andy or acknowledged her skills or resume until the moment that she really wants to lay into Andy and cut her down. You can see it in Andy's eyes that she was really affected by this because she believes Miranda. She believes that Miranda saw something in her because Andy knows that she's more than capable of an assistant job, and no one in her life sees her job with as much importance as her workplace does. Miranda concludes by saying, Anyway, you ended up disappointing me more than any of the other silly girls. Miranda was appealing to Andy's vanity by acknowledging that the assistants Miranda had hired previously worshipped Runway Magazine, but were stupid and silly. Then Miranda takes it a step further and implies that she was taking this failure personally. Miranda told Andy that she saw something in her, but what she really saw in Andy was the ability to manipulate her. Andy going to speak to Nigel after this scene and coming to the conclusion that she just wasn't trying hard enough is a direct result of the manipulation by Miranda in this scene. If Miranda had chosen to just go off on Andy and tell her she's a big dumb idiot for failing, then Andy could have just quit. But Miranda needed to make Andy feel connected to the job in some way. And the way to do that was for Miranda to appeal to Andy's ego. Let me just talk about the inciting incident behind Andy telling Miranda, fuck you, and leaving the job in the book. So the movie shows a lot of instances of unreasonable Miranda demands, like for example, asking for the unreleased Harry Potter book for her twins, right? Now, that one might seem really crazy, but let me actually tell you the impossible demand that made Andy walk off. So after Miranda praises Andy for being like her when she was younger, right? And deciding that uh, her personal life means nothing and her career is everything. More specifically, after deciding to stay in Paris with Miranda after learning that her best friend has been in a car accident and is now in a coma, um, Miranda then tells Andy 
that she has 12 hours to renew her twins' passports from France, uh, or she's fired. <laughs> and that's not something Andy could do, even if she were an employee of the government. <laughs> it's just, that's not happening. And of course, Miranda's a huge bitch about it, being like, oh, this is your job, which is like, that's not her job, what? So yeah, like there were actual impossible demands in the book and the movie just couches that. It's so much softer, right? And let's not forget the book is written by a former assistant of Anna Wintour. Miranda Priestly is a fictionalized version of a real person, a real boss who created that kind of toxic environment. That's why I think it's important to talk about. Even Wintour's colleagues like Andre Leon Talley former creative director to Vogue, have expressed how Wintour's mistreatment extended beyond her assistance. His experiences, coupled with the extreme lack of representation within Vogue's pages and its staff, paint a picture of a rather controlling, manipulative, and racist editor-in-chief. There's a line that gets repeated often to Andy in the movie and in the book, which is, a million girls would kill for that job. The line basically boils down to, you are disposable. The reality of a workplace like one depicted in The Devil Wears Prada is that you could be the most loyal, most shit-eating employee in the room and still be cast aside at a moment's notice. In fact, the movie even shows this happening when Nigel is fucked over by Miranda when she gives the position that he was up for to Jacqueline Foyer to save her own job at Runway. The movie shows this happening twice because Emily's also tossed aside by Miranda for getting sick despite how seriously Emily takes her job. It's also important to note that in both the book and the movie, Andy is supported by her family, not her salary. Her survival is based on privilege, not her resilience or her boss's mentorship. This brings me to question the idea of earning one's position through some kind of internal fortitude. The playing field is not equal, and hard work is not an equalizer. Lastly, let's address a critical point. No one should have to endure abuse as a rite of passage. We need to challenge the narrative around what it means to be successful, and how we get there. It's time to push back against toxic work cultures and advocate for environments that respect and foster genuine talent and effort. We should also remember that the myth of the solitary genius is just that, a myth. Miranda tells Andy at the end of the movie that no one can do what she does. But Miranda knows that's not true, because she had to resort to blackmail to keep her job. She threatened the publisher of Runway with a list of Runway employees, photographers, and models who all agreed to leave with her should she leave. Now, I understand why people sympathize with Miranda's character in the movie, because the movie writers made her a more sympathetic character. They included how Miranda was getting divorced and very upset about it. They toned down the kinds of requests that she makes of Andy, and they even end the movie with Andy still getting a good reference from Miranda. The book, however, shows a much less favorable image of Miranda, with the only moment of levity coming when Andy decides not to leave Paris after she hears that her best friend was in a car crash and is now in a coma. That's when Miranda tells Andy that she sees a lot of herself in Andy. Yikes. Andy also leaves without a good recommendation from Miranda, and she even has to deal with being blackballed by her in the sequel to the Devil Wears Prada novel. So, what do you think? Have you ever endured a workplace like Runway? Did you think it was worth it? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching, and for all my fellow size 6 queens and up, I love you, you're sexy and fashionable, and you deserve to eat that corn chowder. <laughs>